Okay, Lumis, uh, yeah, Lumis uh, JDK proposal um, uh, consists of two parts, virtual threads and structured concurrency. And yeah, like Yip said, there's probably a lot of talks already on conference about this because it's uh, hot at the moment. So I wanted to uh, attack it from uh, the angle that um, what does this mean for us as developer right now? What, what should we do? Um, what do I know, need to know about it? Um, this is copied from the uh, JDK proposal page. Basically, uh, Java already has a very a powerful and flexible uh, concurrency model. However, it might be complex to use. And of, of course, we have different alternatives available. Like I already said, we already have reactive and uh, callbacks and those kind of things. Uh, but none of them uh, hides the complexity for the developer. So the goal of Project Loom is to make concurrent programming in Java very, very easy for us as developers. Going back to the root of the problem, uh, we probably built applications um, that have a lot of uh, requests, uh, a lot of transactions, and also make a lot of network calls or maybe even I.O. calls. And you probably know if you make a request to an ex external service, for instance, and it takes a couple of milliseconds or hundreds of milliseconds to get the response, that in the meantime, that thread that handles that request cannot do anything else. So it's kind of waste. We want to optimize our application that if we have to wait for an I.O. call or for a network call, that in the meantime, we can do something else. So, of course, we can schedule with um, operating system threads. So in the classic uh, request per thread uh, model, for each request, we could say we have a different thread, a Java thread, uh, which um, is one to one to an operating system thread, and then the other threads can do something else to basically keep our throughput up and, uh, and make efficient uh, use of our resources. But the problem is, uh, operating system threads are kind of expensive. They have a, uh, each have their own stack, They're, so they have a big uh, initial memory uh, need. And uh, de therefore, the amount is very limited. You only have uh, uh, a limited amount available. So existing solutions, um, we probably, uh, who, is there anyone who uses callbacks in Java? JavaScript, maybe? That's where it's used more. Uh, reactive programming, which is very nice. Do you uh, have users of reactive programming? Do you also use coroutines? <laughs> okay, good. Um, and while these are all nice solutions, and they all have their specific strengths and all have their specific problems, uh, they each require a very specific programming model. We cannot just say we have this existing Java application without rewriting. We make use of uh, basically being able to handle multiple uh, request responses on the same thread. So what's the answer? Uh, the answer is part one of Project Loom, uh, virtual threads. And virtual threads are basically user mode threads. So they allow us to switch tasks on platform level uh, using our existing synchronous code style that we used to. They have a very low initial memory footprint. I have to say initial because, of course, um, you can still uh, have a lot of memory attached to a single thread. We will talk about it later as well. And that's because the stack is stored on the, actually on the heap. So that's a very nice thing where when you learn Java or you do your Java programming exam, you learn about the stack and the heap. Now we have the stack on the, on the heap. And it's dynamically sized. And it also means we don't have to reserve the stack memory when we spin up a virtual thread. We can uh, increase it later if needed. Uh, because of all of these things, uh, we can have more of them available, actually thousands of more than, than actually platform threads. And the other thing is uh, switching between threads is cheaper as well. So the suspend and resume uh, operations are faster than with platform threads. So how does this look if we, uh, if we look at it, uh, uh, how the threads are mapped? So basically the virtual threads now replace the Java threads as we are used to them. The virtual threads are then mapped onto actually uh, system threads and those system threads are mapped on uh, operating system thread. So we have an extra layer of abstraction in our threading model. Well, what are good use cases? Uh, like I mentioned, if you have latency due to I.O. or due to uh, network calls, and if you have lots of requests that you need to handle from the outside, uh, that's a very good use case. Uh, another one you, you might think of, if I have high computation and I want to do more parallel processing, which actually 
not that much uh, influence in that area. So it's basically, if you have latency, if your thread would be doing nothing and can do something else, then it helps. Uh, I have an example in computation. We can actually have a look at it later. But that's not the main focus. So we're not focusing on speed, but we're actually focusing on throughput. These two cars are on the same thread. The blue one is basically blocked by the red one. Um, and if we had two lanes, although they're going slower because they're in the pit lane, they would arrive both at the same time or they can arrive at the same time at the end of the pit lane. So our throughput is actually two cars instead of one. Okay, um, let's compare it to uh, existing solutions. Um, actually, I don't use it much myself, but if you have uh, asynchronous code with callbacks, you can you can define uh, a function parameter, and then instead of uh, just giving a parameter, you can pass in a lambda function, and uh, that should be called when the uh, function is done. But you already see from this example where we call two services, and let's let's assume that the service calls an external network server, so there's actually some latency involved. We call the first service, and then with the result of the first service, we want to call the second service. And you can imagine that if you have maybe some if statements, some try catches, and maybe a third service, this can become very unreadable very fast. So then uh, what you could do is you could use uh, completable futures instead of callbacks. Well, completable futures already uh, looks uh, uh, way nicer. So instead of passing in a callback function, we just return a completable future. Um, the nice thing about completable futures is you can asynchronously wait for the result. So if you look at the Java future, if you want to get a result from that, that's a blocking operation in standard Java. Uh, with the completable future, it's an asynchronous uh, operation. So you can actually asynchronously <coughs> fire two requests to two different network services, and then you can say, okay, I want to combine the result. When the results both come in, you can do something with it. Uh, you join it, and then you have the result. Um, a completely futures, I don't use them a lot. I don't really like the API. Uh, I, th I thought if you if you want to do asynchronous programming, why not do a reactive? Uh, because it's a bit more powerful. It has a functional programming style. <coughs> so again, if the call service is an asynchronous a function and it's uh, calling an external service, instead of a completable future, we can now return a mono. Mo mono basically means uh, uh, something or nothing uh, comes out of as a result. Um, you can combine it with other mono calls by using flat map. So you have one service and you want to re uh, the result of the service, you want to combine it with the result of another service. You do a flat map and then you subscribe the result and then in the subscribe uh, you have access to the result and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, if, if you like React programming, it can be very fun, it can be very powerful, you can do a lot of different things with it, especially if time is involved in your use case. So if you have uh, data arriving over time, for instance, but it can also be a little bit overwhelming. I think if, you used, if you've used reactive programming or you're, you have joined a project where already reactive programming were used, um, these chains can basically get very long and it can also become a bit unreadable and you de it's definitely a paradigm shift from uh, uh, synchronous programming to reactive programming. And one of the other things is you have to be really aware whether you use blocking calls or not. So this is based around the fact that every call you make is a non-blocking. So if you have, for instance, a database call, you need to use an asynchronous database driver to leverage this. And if it's not an asynchronous database driver, then you have to be aware from the fact that it's actually you're making a blocking call to your database. You cannot just do that from your reactive chain. Well, you can. That's probably the, one of the aspects of the problem. You can, but you shouldn't. So you still have to be aware, do not block the main thread. Um, maybe fans of Kotlin in the in the room. Kotlin has a very elegant solution for uh, the asynchronous problem, which are coroutines. Coroutines basically is <coughs> a sync await. So if you know from JavaScript or TypeScript, uh, other programming languages, as they have they call it a sync await. In Kotlin, it's called coroutines. Coroutines roughly allow you to program in the synchronous programming way but making use of asynchronous functions, which are called suspend functions. You still have to declare in your code that the, the code you are running is asynchronous, and you cannot just go from a suspension function to a normal function. So you still have to be aware of the fact, am I blocking the main thread? Is this an asynchronous function or is this a synchronous function? But it does allow you to 
um, yeah, do more uh, synchronous style programming in, and still using asynchronous uh, programming model. Um, and we also have to know that this is Kotlin, so it um, runs on the JDK, but uh, coroutines is not natively supported by the JDK. They have to do work to convert your uh, coroutine code into something that works on the JDK. Uh, and then the virtual threads. So <clears throat> how does the programming uh, model look in virtual threads if we call two services? Well, actually, it just looks the same as what we do now. So if you now have two calls to external service, and those are blocking calls, um, by using virtual threads, they become non-blocking calls because they don't block the main thread anymore. They actually yield the main thread if they're waiting for a response from an external service, for instance, a response from a network call. And then in the time that we are waiting for one response, we can make another call and we can wait for that. So we can do multiple things at the same time without changing our programming model, which is really nice. Um, so for instance, these two calls are now blocking. So if you make on Java everything up until 20, uh, any of these calls, we, you are blocking the main thread. So getting the result from a future, but also thread.sleep will block the main thread. Uh, from Java 21 on, uh, when you're running on a virtual threading model, these two are not blocking the main thread anymore. These become yield operations. Okay. Um, I hope that you think, okay, this looks nice. I also want these virtual threads. How do I get them? Uh, where do you get them from? Um, you need at least a Java 19 with preview functionality enabled, or you have to wait till Java 21. Uh, but then you can, <coughs> with this new uh, uh, low level API, you can actually create virtual threads yourself. So instead of thread dot of platform, you say, thread dot of virtual, and it will create a virtual thread. And then the way you use that thread is exactly the same as you would use a current thread in Java. So you can create a runnable and you can say, thread start this runnable, and that will be exactly the same. But I assume that you don't want to make virtual threads yourself, right? Because if you're already programming at that level, um, yeah, you're already in, in that complexity, and actually what we want, is we want to use virtual threads, but we don't want to manage them ourselves. So let's look in a more uh, a real world example. Um, I've prepared a demo with actually uh, four uh, variants of the same application. Um, we have uh, three of them are Spring Boot applications and that what, what is what I uh, have the most experience with, which I'm using now as well. And one is a uh, Helidon Nima example, which is actually a new web server based on, completely based on virtual threads. So you can think of it as a replacement for Netty, which is uh, asynchronous I.O. based, uh, and then this one is virtual threads based. Um, well, the demo is, is the following. We have a client, in, in our cli uh, case, the client will be uh, JMeter. JMeter we can use to send requests and do a small performance measure. Then we have the service we are testing, so that's the either the just the normal Spring Boot one or the reactive one or the non-blocking a virtual threads one. And then we call a, a, a backend server, which is reasonably slow. Um, and the scenario is we have 10, uh, we have 1,000 users, and uh, each user makes 10 requests. And then we want to measure the throughput and the uh, request duration. So this is how our backend service looks. Um, I implemented it in Reactive to avoid all problems associated with uh, a threading uh, <laughs> request, um, we say request per thread model. So in the reactive, so it's, it, it has a delay of a thousand milliseconds, but it doesn't become a, a blocking um, service in a, as a downstream server, so we don't run into problems there. Um, okay, what do we expect? Um, if I call a web service, external web service, which has a delay of uh, one second, I expect that my application has a little bit overhead, so if I make my call, it will be around just above one second, right? But now, what if I have a thousand users and each user make 10 requests? Then probably, because these um, calls are all blocking, the request uh, uh, average response time goes up, right? And the throughput uh, is lower. And then I expect, because uh, in our Loom example and our uh, reactive programming example, uh, because they are, these are optimized to handle more requests on the same thread, so they don't block the thread. 
it should be around that one second, right? It should be comparable to if it's one user. Okay, so let's have a look if uh, what I'm saying is true. Is this readable? Yes, good. Um, I already have my backend service uh, started on AD81. And now I have a classic uh, Spring Boot controller, just a REST controller. It will call my external service and then it will return the result. So I need to start this. And then we go to Gmeter. Uh, Gmeter just does one uh, HTTP request uh, to the hello. And uh, I defined a thread group. So we have, like I said, a thousand threads. And then each user, each thread does 10, re 10 requests. And let's run it. And this takes a while to complete. Mm. I did prepare all the results in, uh, in slide anyway. So what I wanted to show you um, was basically if you uh, run the examples uh, with a, a normal Java application, uh, blocking application, uh, the request time goes up really fast. And it starts at around 1,000, and the line uh, on top is around 5,000. So um, the average response time becomes five seconds instead of one second. And if you compare it with the reactive one, which is the WebFlex one, it stays around one second. And then if you compare it with using the same Spring Boot application, but now running on virtual threads, you see that also the line stays flat and is around one second. And in uh, Loom, but then on Helidon Nima, so not on uh, Spring Boot, it's the same result. So how can we um, basically explain uh, what happened? Well, the average response time of reactive and virtual threads is comparable. And this is because the mechanism is actually very similar. What they do is they handle more requests on the same thread by switching between these tasks. Um, our classic thread model, it, it becomes uh, blocked, basically. Every uh, uh, re outgoing request, which takes one second, is basically blocking the rest of the request. We have to wait until it returns, and then we can handle the next request. So our thread per request model has way uh, lower tr throughput. I think I have the numbers as well. Uh, the blocking sp uh, Spring Boot application, it handled around 200 requests per second. And the other three that do the task switching on one thread, it was around 1,000 requests per second. So what do I need to do um, if I have a Spring Boot uh, tree application and I want to use virtual threads? Because that is eventually what we're looking for, right? We don't want to create those virtual threads ourselves. Um, well, actually, it's those two beans that we need. We need to provide Spring, uh, um, if we run on Tomcat, actually, um, and virtual thread uh, per task executor. And if you paste this in a conf configuration uh, class, then these two uh, executors will be defined for Tomcat, and you can actually use virtual thread. So this is the only thing you have to do. The REST controller, it looks exactly the same. You don't have to change your code. So if your um, uh, existing application is just normal synchronous Java, this is still how it looks. If you want to use WebFlux, if you want to do reactive programming, it looks completely different. This is uh, using Project Reactor. So this is your um, functional style programming model. And if you want to do uh, virtual threads with Helidon uh, Nima, uh, which is actually a uh, micro profile, um, you can also do that, but also your uh, um, programming model is, is different. Done that. Um, so, uh, in summary, um, use cases with external calls, we can leverage the user mode threads, but it's not the cheaper task switching per se that gives us this advantage. So, it's, the, it's mainly focused on the throughput. Um, so, you say, can I, what happens when we do it for a compute, for instance? So, if we have an application that has a high CPU. A requirement, uh, but no external calls and no I.O. We pray that this works. So basically, if it's readable, I can make it a bit bigger. So basically what we do is we have a range of numbers from one to one million, 
and we want to calculate the sum. Um, and we have two uh, approaches. In the first approach, we use platform threads. So we say we make a thread factory um, of platform threads. And then we uh, have the list of numbers, so one till a million. We ask for a parallel stream, and then we sum uh, the results, and then we want to get the result. And then the other approach is actually the same code, but then we use virtual threads. And the only difference between this is the cost of thread switching, right? Platform threads have that high stack, so that's more expensive to switch on. And virtual threads have a lower uh, uh, cost of switching. So if we run this, uh, we see that uh, processing time for platform threads is roughly 100 milliseconds, and for virtual threads, it's 66. So it's still uh, faster, it still helps to have virtual threads in this case, but the um, difference in throughput was five times. We had 200 requests per second versus 1,000 requests per second, and now it's not even half. It's uh, around 40%. And the funny thing is, if you um, don't use parallel threads, uh, parallel streams, um, you don't do any task switching, so it's even faster. Because for this example, just adding numbers together doesn't make any sense to run it on more threads, right? Just run it on main thread, uh, it's uh, way faster than having the overhead of switching to parallel threads. Okay, I, um, I explained that you can use regular code on virtual threads and that most calls that we would consider blocking are not blocking anymore. So then the question of course is, which calls are still blocking, right? Uh, it's important to know if you use virtual threads that there's still two, th two ways of blocking the main thread. Uh, first is if you use synchronized blocks, and this is probably the one that you could run into, although I don't think uh, much people still use synchronized blocks. Uh, and the other one is calling native methods. And calling native methods, um, there's no way around that. That, that, that can al always be blocking. But for synchronized blocks, we have a, a solution. But uh, let's look at the code first. So if you're running on virtual threads, and if you uh, call thread.sleep for a duration of one second, we only block the virtual thread. We don't block the underlying main thread. Now if you put that same code in a synchronized function, it becomes a blocking method. So that's important to know. If you do any blocking work in a synchronized method, um, it's, it becomes a blocking method for the main thread. So how can we solve this? Well, uh, luckily since Java 8 already, we have um, a programmatic lock, which is called uh, reentrant lock. And you can basically define this lock. And then if you need a resource and you want to be the only one using that resource, or, or you, maybe you want to call, make a call to an external service, which only has one connection, so you want to make sure only one outgoing connection is there, not all requests trigger a connection. You can say try lock, so try to acquire the lock, when you get the lock, you do something, and then finally you release the lock. So if you have any synchronized blocks in your code and you want to prepare for virtual threads, then uh, look for a reentrant lock. Well, another thing to <coughs> uh, be aware of is, uh, of course, a thread local. A thread local is a, um, um, an instance um, where you can store information that's bound to a thread. And for instance, this is used uh, sometimes when you do authentication and you want to pass on the user in your thread, or maybe uh, you want to use it for, for logging, for um, um, uh, metrics, and those kind of things. So thread local is used. So how does it behave for virtual threads? Well, the good news is uh, virtual threads all have their own thread local. So you can still use thread local with your virtual threads if you want. But there are a few things to be aware of. Um, first of all, a uh, thread local can become uh, uh, quite big. The thing is, uh, thread local, um, uh, for each thread, uh, the memory will be reserved um, that's there, and it will also be copied into child threads. So everything you pu put in there um, can mean a me higher memory footprint. And also, thread local is mutable. It is something that we you run in already. So if you have multiple threads with the same uh, thre um, 
multiple child threads with the same thread local, it's possible that the state get mu uh, gets mutated. Um, so let's, let's have a look. Uh, the thread local example. So again, we have two examples. Um, this should be off platform. We have uh, two threads, two platform threads, and they, are, they each get their own thread uh, local version. Um, and one uh, puts in uh, platform thread one, second one puts in platform thread two. So we assume that if you uh, print the, v the value from thread one, it is thread one. If you print the value from thread two, it's thread true. And the same goes for virtual threads, but now we call them virtual threads. So if you run this, we can actually see that uh, platform thread one uh, still has the value, uh, two has still has the value of two and one still has the value of one. And for virtual threads, it's the same. So the virtual threads if each have their own instance of the thread local. But um, since they can become uh, a, a big because, uh, uh, and we want to keep the, the memory footprint of the virtual threads low, uh, in JDK 21, together with Project Loom, a new thing called scoped values will be introduced. And a scoped value is um, uh, uh, yeah, a, a thread local um, alternative that only exists within this, a certain scope. So in this case, it only exists in, a, in this lambda function. So we can say we want a scoped value of type string, we put a test value in it, and then within our lambda function, we can use it and we can, we can print, print it. And the good thing to know is it's immutable. So if you have any child threads, uh, it's just reference, it's not copied. So it's way cheaper to have this scoped value. Now I have to quickly check the time. Mm, we can do that example, I think. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this actually, uh, in this demo, we have a scoped value of type string, and we set the value test value, and then Within the scope, we try to read uh, that value, and that should be uh, uh, present, so it should be test value. But then, if you have the same value, and then without, uh, out of that scope, you try to read it, we actually expect you get an exception. So that's true. Inside the lambda, we, just get, we can just print the value test value, and then outside of the lambda, we get a no such element exception. So that's what scoped values are four. Okay, that was um, about what I had about virtual threads. Now, the second part of Project Loom is structured concurrency. And virtual threads solve the asynchronous problem by letting us uh, use synchronous code, but then in user mode threads. But you still have use cases, of course, where you want to do um, parallel operations. So you want to do concurrency, and you have to manage those virtual threads because you don't want to do it yourself. And this is where structured concurrency comes in. So for instance, if you want to run things in parallel and want to collect all the results, or maybe you want to um, just uh, uh, spin up a bunch uh, uh, of instances of a piece of code, and then the first one that returns, you want to use that one, or you want to do things like retry and timeout, you can use a structured concurrency. Um, so we lazily define a computation and then we have an orchestrator, and the orchestrator is called structured task scope. And then depending on the type of structured task scope, we can do these things. So running in parallel and collecting results, or running in parallel and then only collect the first one. And the good thing to know is that um, the scope of the thread, so the lifetime of the thread, is bound to the scope of the code. So the threads do not exist anymore outside of that scope, which makes it way more manageable than if you just start spinning up threads. Um, yeah, let's just show this example here. So we have two examples. And the first example, we want to have uh, uh, two calls to an external surface. 
and we want the result of both those calls. Well, in that case, you create a structured task scope with um, a shutdown on failure type, which means uh, only uh, quit if there's a failure and, and if it's successful, run to the end. And if we have that uh, call service and that call service is uh, doing a sleep for uh, one se second and the call service two is doing a sleep for two seconds, then uh, how much time do we think uh, does this code need to complete, roughly? So two calls, one is one second, one is two seconds. Two, two right? Because we run them in parallel. That's exactly what we, what we like to um, run them for. And then if you have uh, another example where we say, okay, we want to run these two services, but we only care about the result of one, we do shutdown on success. So whenever one of the tasks is successful, we stop. And we have the same uh, delay. So if these same two services, one is one second, one is two seconds, how long do we think it takes? One. Excellent. Last parallel session of the day, people are still sharp. And uh, the code runs, which is also very nice. So the first example, we get our hello world roughly over two seconds. Of course, always a bit of overhead. And in the second example, we get uh, our result only hello because the world cost lost. That took too long uh, in one second. OK, so uh, virtual threads and structured concurrency. Uh, we can leverage virtual threads without structured concurrency. Structured so concurrency is a threading model on top of virtual uh, threads. And it aims to reduce errors with concurrent programming. So it should make it easier to uh, manage threads and do uh, computational work uh, without making uh, threading errors. Uh, if you want to start now, um, that's possible. You need uh, JDK 19 or 20 and you need to enable preview. I showed you in the slide what you need if you have Spring Boot. You need a virtual thread execute, uh, yeah, virtual thread task executor. You also have alternatives. You can have a look at Helidon Nima. Uh, you can have a look at Quarkus, which is also available for virtual threads. And even Tomcat has its own uh, Loom executor. So if you want to play around with, then any of those uh, can satisfy you already. If you say, I like this a lot, I want to prepare because September uh, it will be released, so I don't think you want to use it now in production. But if you want to prepare, uh, upgrade to Java 20 uh, because then you will be ready for 21. Upgrade to Spring Boot 3, which has Spring Framework 6, which is uh, ready for virtual threads. And replace your synchronized blocks with reentrant lock. And I actually started a project last year, and before this project we did a reactive project and a coroutine project, and I explicitly decided to use plain Java, plain Spring Boot, no reactive, no web flux, because I knew if you stay very close to that um, simple uh, stack, then you can very easily upgrade to virtual threads, and you will actually get the same benefits as coroutines and reactive programming. Um, which leads probably to the question, is Reactive dead? So did we have our fun uh, couple of years of Reactive? Um, the answer is always, it depends. Of course, there's uh, very much similarities between these two, if you're thinking at, about optimizing a trading model, uh, optimizing throughput. But you will also have to know that <coughs> Reactive is not only doing more things at the same time on the same thread. Uh, Reactive also deals with the problem of infinite streams. So if you have data coming in over time, but you don't know how much data it is, and there, you don't know when, when the data ends, um, Reactive streams still has a good programming model for that. So there's, uh, there's something that is not solved by virtual threads. And of course, if you like a functional programming model, that's also uh, what Reactive has. The virtual threads will just be your synchronous programming model and not a functional programming model. Uh, then what about Kotlin coroutines? Actually, very similar. Um, Kotlin coroutines has a very nice API for concurrent programming, but also has APIs for uh, things that Reactive solve. They have flow and channels, which are basically hot and cold sources, so you can also deal with infinite streams. Um, it, you have to know that it does. Uh, it, it is based on non-blocking I.O., the same with Reactive. So this means it exposes a little bit 
of complexity to us as a developer. You have to be aware which part of your code use blocking calls and which part of your code use non-blocking calls. Uh, so you actually that application, your application is split in those two. Um, <coughs> uh, virtual threads make uh, uh, the coroutine part easier, but there's still uh, reasons to use uh, Kotlin coroutines. And of course, um, the, the nicest thing is if you like Kotlin and even if you like coroutines, um, you could use them on top of virtual threads. So one thing does not exclude the other. Virtual thread will still be a thread. And you can, can use the coroutines on top of that. A uh, little bit of an overview in time. Uh, the Loom was introduced as a preview feature, feature last year in September 2022. We got a new version in March this year, and then the next one will be available in September, and then finally we can use it for real. Um, summarizing, uh, it choose the right uh, tool for the job. That's always the case. So if you only care about parallelism, if you don't want to... Uh, deal with infinite data streams or make more complex concurrent programming. Just wait for virtual threads or start playing with it already uh, because you will get them for free on Java 21. And then I still have eight minutes, right? Okay, let's keep those for questions, I guess. I had prepared a little demo where I migrate the current application we're using in two virtual threads, but I think it's not uh, enough time. But I will tell you uh, the ID behind it. I was just trying it um, two weekends ago for fun, so I upgraded to Spring Boot 3. I um, enabled in the Java compiler um, enable preview. Then I added that virtual thread executor that I had on my slide, and that was basically it. I could start up the application, uh, it used virtual threads, and the throughput was around twice as high in the performance test that I did. So. It can actually be that simple. Okay, all my demos, including the not working one, which should work, is uh, in my GitHub. The presentation is there as well. Uh, so yeah, you can just clone the whole thing. All the examples will be there, and the slides is in uh, Markdown, and there's HTML, should be HTML version as well.